pro-life speeches that you will ever hear a pope give saying that the, 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 the right to life is the primordial right. Uh, it is the one upon which the entire uh, structure of human rights is based. Uh, and again, uh, <coughs> in his speech to diplomats on January 13th, another annual speech the Pope gives to the diplomatic corps accredited to the Holy See, he defined abortion as the most horrific of crimes. So take my word for it, folks. This is a robustly pro-life Pope. There is no retreat and no surrender from the church's defense of the gospel of life. Now that said, uh, I think Francis also believes that there are other elements of Catholic social teaching that have not always gotten the same level of attention that he wants to lift up, upon which he wants to train a global spotlight. The, and th they are what we traditionally call the social gospel, that is, concern for the poor, uh, concern for the environment, uh, race relations, concern for peace, that sort of cluster uh, of social justice concerns, economic justice, and, and so on. Uh, and, and the proof of how committed he is to that social gospel is that the three gutsiest political interventions of this pope to date over his first year have all concerned some element of the social gospel. The first came uh, on July 8th. Actually, you know, uh, Francis's trip to Brazil uh, at the end of July was not his first trip outside of Rome. His first trip outside of Rome came on the 8th of July to the southern Mediterranean island of Lampedusa. Lampedusa is a major point of arrival for impoverished migrants and refugees from Africa and the Middle East who are trying to reach Europe. What normally happens with these people uh, is that they spend 18 months, two years, three years in some cases, trying to make their way to either Libya or Tunisia. They are typically horribly exploited along the way, sometimes sold into slavery, sometimes sexually abused, and so on. They finally get there. They have to fork over whatever limited resources they have left to be put on one of these rickety, overcrowded, dangerous boats. And then they try to make the crossing uh, across the Mediterranean uh, to reach uh, Lampedusa, typically. Uh, 20,000 of them have died over just the last two decades trying to make that crossing. Pope Francis went to Lampedusa that day. He laid a wreath in the sea to commemorate the migrants and refugees who have, who have died trying to reach the shores of Europe. He then gave a speech in which, in which he blasted what he called the globalization of indifference to migrants and refugees. And that day, July 8th, was the first day he rolled out what has since become one of the standard rhetorical tropes of his papacy which is the contrast between what he calls a throwaway culture. That is a culture in which whole categories of humanity are regarded as essentially disposable, the unborn, the elderly, the sick, migrants and refugees, contrasting that with what he calls a culture of welcome, culture of welcome, which is what he believes the world is called to be and what he believes the church is called to model. Okay? Uh, and you have to understand, if you know anything at all about the politics of contemporary Europe, and particularly the politics of contemporary Italy, you know that policy on immigration is by far the most divisive political issue in that culture. So the fact that Francis chose to make this his debut on the political stage was, in context, a remarkably gutsy move. Second high-profile political intervention came during the Brazil trip. It was July 25th when Francis visited uh, one of what the Brazilians called the favelas, that's the Portuguese term for a slum. This place is called Virginia. Uh, it's a place known in Rio de Janeiro as the Gaza Strip of Rio because it has been the site of bloody clashes between police and security forces and the drug gangs that tend to dominate the scene. A year before the Pope got there, <coughs> the Brazilian authorities had unleashed a foul mix of armored personnel carriers in this particular slum, basically laid waste to the place, and then at the end claimed that they had brought peace. Okay? Francis stood in that spot a year later, wagging his finger and saying that no attempt to bring peace will ever be successful unless it does justice to the fact that too many people in the society are excluded from the new circles of opportunity being created and cast to the margins. Again, in context, bear in mind, popes, when they travel internationally, are always reluctant to embarrass their hosts. 
But on this particular occasion, Francis felt it was a point important enough that he was willing to risk being seen as directly defying and criticizing the policies of his host government. That was a second intervention. Uh, and third, uh, of course, was the, his intervention on Syria. You may remember, back in September, the drums of war were beginning to beat in Washington and in Paris and in London. It looked as if the major Western powers were on the brink of going to war in Syria to try to bring down the regime of Bashar al-Assad. In that context, Francis not only unleashed a full court diplomatic press in the Vatican, which included bringing in all of the ambassadors accredited to the Holy See to try to lay out the case against war, but he also called a global day of prayer and fasting on the 7th of September for the 1.2 billion Catholics of the world to pray for peace, including presiding himself over a remarkably evocative penitential service in St. Peter's Square, a four-hour service. Uh, and he was there for the whole thing. Uh, and he used every, every other tool in his toolbox uh, to try to resist the rush to war uh, in Syria, including, by the way, sending out pro-peace tweets uh, and so on. <coughs> and although it's always hard to parcel out responsibility for something that didn't happen, there are a lot of foreign policy experts who believe that Francis's intervention, this forceful intervention against the war, was one of the most important ingredients in derailing the press for war uh, at that moment. Let's sum up. The three highest profile political interventions of this pope to date have been a pro-immigrant statement, a statement of solidarity with the poor, and an anti-war statement. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the social gospel in action, and I think it's the kind of thing we will continue to see uh, on Francis's watch. Finally, mercy. Mercy as the core Christian message, as Francis understands it at this moment in time. Folks, in, in my business, the media business, we have tried to come up with all kinds of handy-dandy little sound bites to capture the, the essence of the new pope. Okay? Uh, so, you know, some people will call him the pope of the poor. Some people will call him the people's pope. Some people will call him the maverick pope. And, and all of these things capture some parts of, of the picture. But I'm here to tell you tonight, I'm going to lay before you a prediction that when the final word on the Francis papacy is, is written, the single best descriptive phrase to capture the essence of this man will be the Pope of Mercy. The Pope of Mercy. Okay, I submit to you that's how he's going to be remembered because mercy is the core of his spirituality uh, and it's also the core of his pastoral agenda. Mercy, quite literally, is this pope's motto. You know, the motto he had as the Archbishop of, uh, of uh, Buenos Aires that he's carried with him into the papacy uh, is a line from the Venerable Bede. It's kind of a complicated Latin formula, but it, it comes from a homily the Venerable Bede wrote uh, about chapter 7 of the Gospel of Matthew. It's the scene with Jesus and Zacchaeus, the tax collector. You remember when Zacchaeus climbs the tree and Jesus beckons him down to come with him? And, and the line is, Jesus saw him through the eyes of mercy and chose him. Through the eyes of mercy. Okay, that's this Pope's motto. Literally, it's his motto. Mercy was there in the first homily, the first Sunday homily he delivered as Pope, uh, four days after his election, which Francis chose to celebrate not in St. Peter's Basilica, but in St. Anne's Church, which is the small parish church for the worker bees in the Vatican. It's where they go to worship on Sundays. Francis went there and delivered a homily in which he said, in my opinion, the strongest message of the Lord is mercy. Strongest message of the Lord is mercy. Uh, it's the, the idea of mercy uh, is there in Francis' signature phrase. Okay, the thing he, he repeats over and over and over again. So often it, it probably ought to be printed on t-shirts. You know, in my experience, I've covered three popes, uh, John Paul II, Benedict XVI, and, and now Francis, and they all kind of have a signature phrase, all right? John Paul II's was, be not afraid. Be not afraid. Okay, this invitation to the church to recapture its missionary self-confidence uh, after decades of introspection and self-doubt, the, the Latin equivalent of which was duke in altum, set out into the deep. Okay, that was the signature John Paul phrase. With Benedict XVI, again, there's no mystery. The signature phrase was reason and faith. 
You know, the argument Benedict was trying to make to the secular world is that reason and faith need each other, that human reason without faith becomes skepticism and nihilism, that faith without reason becomes extremism and fundamentalism, and he, and he kept coming back to that. And again with Pope Francis, although it's still early in the game, it is already crystal clear what this Pope's signature phrase is. And the signature phrase is, the Lord never tires of forgiving. The Lord never tires of forgiving. And sometimes Francis adds, it is we who get tired of asking for forgiveness. A core idea there is mercy. And mercy is also in Francis' practice, that is, in his deeds. He is now, of course, the Pope is also the Bishop of Rome, and one thing that, po that Popes do is they make visits to Roman parishes because they're trying to be a good local bishop. Francis has now visited six Roman parishes. The first visit, first such visit, came on May 26th. Francis went out to the Roman parish of Saints Elizabeth and Zechariah, which is a parish in a working-class neighborhood of Rome called Aor. He was supposed to get there at 10.30 in the morning, okay? The papal helicopter lands at 9.45. So you can imagine the heart attack that the pastor basically had. So he runs out to the parking lot where the papal helicopter has landed. Francis pops out, uh, apologizes for the yearly start, but he says, look, uh, in addition to saying mass and chatting with the people, I would also like to hear some confessions. Now understand, this was not part of the program. Okay, so the pastor went and grabbed eight people, basically at random, okay, uh, and told them, you're going to confession. Okay. Now this pastor, who's a Romanian immigrant by the name of Bioni Ambris, he told me the story, it's kind of cute. Uh, Father Bioni, which everybody there calls him Padre Ben, all right? So when Padre Ben said to these guys, you're going to confession, their response was, well, that's very sweet, Father, but we're actually here to see the Pope. To which his response was, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Uh, and so he drug them into the church, right, and, you know, lined them up in front of the confessional, and then one by one, Pope Francis sat, listened to their sins, and administered God's forgiveness. Now, in part, this was just Francis wanting to be a good bishop of Rome, but in part, I think, it was important to him for the world to see the Pope making a point out of celebrating the church's premier rite of mercy. Okay. I think if you understand this Pope's commitment to mercy, Okay, you will understand a great deal of his vision and program for the church. Because what I believe is that virtually everything he is doing as Pope, from the nitty-gritty details of what do you do about the Vatican Bank, on up to pastoral policy on divorced and remarried Catholics and beyond, I think all of it fundamentally is premised on the desire that when the outside world looks at the Catholic Church, what they will see is a community of mercy community that doesn't just pay lip service to mercy, but that is genuinely committed to mercy in its internal life. Okay? So that when you move, I think his desire is so that when you move within the Catholic Church, you will see mercy, and you will hear mercy, and you will taste mercy, and you will feel mercy, and you will almost smell mercy. Now, let's be clear. As a minister of the Christian gospel, Francis understands that he has two obligations. He has to pronounce God's judgment on a broken world, okay? But he also has to pronounce God's mercy on a hurting and broken world. I think his calculation is that the world has heard our judgment with crystal clarity. Now it is time for them to hear our mercy. And again, this is not a journalistic theory. Aboard the papal plane, back to that flight uh, in late July, one of the, it was actually my question. I asked Francis a question about divorced and remarried Catholics, and he answered the question. But then he went on to say, I would like to make a broader point. And the broader point is this. I believe that this moment in history is a kairos for mercy. Using that evocative Greek New Testament term that means a kind of privileged moment in God's plan for salvation. He said this is a kairos for mercy. He understands his papacy to be a kairos for mercy. Ladies and gentlemen, if you understand nothing else about Pope Francis, understand that his core spiritual value is mercy. And if you see what he's doing through the eyes of mercy, if you own that line that comes from the venerable bead, through the eyes of mercy he makes decisions, you will understand a great deal of what Francis is about. Okay. Final thought about Pope Francis, and then we'll see where you want to take the conversation. Final thought is this. 
<clears throat> Despite what I said at the top about Francis's astronomic approval ratings and the popular enthusiasm and the media enthusiasm and all of that, there is no doubt that reaction to Francis is not completely enthusiastic. Uh, you know, there, there also is, both inside and outside the church, some ambivalence, some concern, some hand-wringing uh, over where things are going. Now, some people want to analyze this in terms of left and right as if it's the conservatives who are worried and the liberals who are rapturous. Uh, I'm not sure it breaks out that neatly. I mean, frankly, I think if you look at the Catholic landscape, I think, sure, you, you can find a conservative constituency that is worried that things are going too far, but you can easily find a liberal constituency that, thinks aren't, that believes things are not going nearly far enough. I mean, let's remember, this is a pope who, when asked for his opinions, on abortion and gay marriage said, my opinions are those of the church because I'm a son of the church, who when asked for his position on women's ordination said, that door was closed by John Paul II and it's not gonna be reopened, who when asked would he name women cardinals said, absolutely not, and anyone who wants that suffers from clericalism. So I, I think both on left and right, you can find people who are ambivalent. So I, I, let's forget ideology for the moment. I, I think the, the way to analyze the, the kind of, to the extent that there is blowback or negative reaction, uh, I think the better frame may be an evangelical frame, that is something drawn from the Gospels. I like to use the parable of the prodigal son. You know, and what I sometimes say is that Pope Francis has an older son problem. Okay? And what I mean is this, that I think since his election, Francis has done a magnificent job reaching out to the prodigal, you know, daughters and sons of the postmodern world, that is, people who have felt alienated from the church and so on. But I think there are some older sons in the church, that is, people who feel they've been carrying water for the Catholic Church for an awful long time, uh, who feel a little bit left out of the action. Okay. I, I think we can spot at least five such older sons. Uh, I think there are some pro-lifers who, despite what I said a moment ago, still worry uh, that Francis may be engaging in unilateral disarmament in the culture wars. Uh, I think there are some doctrinal purists uh, who worry that this Pope's freewheeling, shoot-from-the-hip style courts confusion. I mean, I you know, in that interview with La Repubblica, when Francis says, God is not a Catholic, you can just hear this crowd screaming, what the hell does that mean? <laughs> right? Uh, I think there are some liturgical traditionalists who do not associate with this pope the same reverence and even awe for the worship of the church that they would associate with Benedict XVI. Uh, I think there are some political conservatives who worry that this pope's emphasis on the social gospel is going to shade off into an uncritical embrace of the secular left. Uh, and I think that there are some church personnel, including some people in the Vatican, who are quite frankly just tired of hearing the pope take pot shots at them. You know, when they read interviews in which he calls them careerists or says they're infected with the leprosy of a royal court, you know, or whatever it is, uh, you know, who think, hey, that's not me, okay? Now listen, again, back to Francis being a savvy Jesuit politician. Take it to the bank. The, the Francis is aware of this reaction uh, and over time is going to do everything he can to reach out to these folks. I mean, I don't know if you sto folks heard the recent story of Mauro Palombo. Palombo is a kind of well-known, uh, fairly traditionalist Catholic commentator in Italy. Uh, in an October, he wrote an essay for Corriere della Sera, which is like the New York Times of Italy, the headline of which was Perché questo Papa non ci piace, which means why we don't like this Pope. Okay? Flash forward to December. Palombo's, I think it was his, his uncle, or some member of his family gets sick okay, and is in the hospital. Francis calls him on the phone. Oh, and by the way, you should know, this is something Francis does all the time, okay? He works his own phone, and he is notorious for just calling people out of the blue. I mean, I'm actually feeling a little ticked off because I'm the only guy I know who has not gotten a phone call from the Pope. I'm still waiting for the phone to ring. But anyway, so he picks up the phone, uh, and he calls Palumbo, uh, and he says, look, I understand that your uncle uh, is sick, and I want you to know that uh, I'm going to say Mass for him tomorrow morning, and I'm going to be praying for him. And Palumbo said, well, Holy Father, that means so much to me, uh, especially because, you know, I wrote that piece about you that wasn't so nice. And Francis said to him, no, 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 I, I, I read that, and I understand that you wrote it out of love, and these are things I need to hear. Okay. 
So I think he is over time going to try to, to bring, bring people along. I think he wants to be a unifying pope. I mean, that's the whole logic for canonizing John the 23rd and John Paul II together on April 27th. He knows John the 23rd is a kind of icon of the Catholic left. John Paul II in many ways is a kind of icon of the Catholic right. So putting them together is an obvious statement about unity. However, I think there is also something the rest of us can do to sort of help Francis in this regard. Uh, and and let, me, let me start my case here with an observation. Well, the observation is this. The highest priority of the Catholic Church at the moment is supposed to be what we call the new evangelization. Okay? That is, trying to reintroduce the Catholic message to a sometimes jaded, sometimes skeptical, sometimes hostile secular world. And I think it is an empirical fact, no matter where you are on the spectrum of reaction to Francis, whether you the, are the most enthusiastic or the most ambivalent or, or someplace in the middle, it is an empirical fact that this pope is the best missionary calling card Catholicism is likely to get in our lifetimes. In the sense that the way in which he has captured the imagination of the world, the way in which he has become a media sensation, means that eyeballs are on this man and therefore eyeballs are on the church. We have the world's attention. Now, the question is, now that the world is looking at us, what are they going to see? Are they going to see a community of people on fire with passion for the gospel who are trying to come together to capitalize on the new momentum Francis has created, to genuinely turn the Catholic Church into the field hospital he's called it to be, the place in which the wounds of humanity are cured? Is that what they're gonna see? Or are they going to see a debating society in which Catholics are constantly over one, at one another's throats debating the exact doctrinal valence of every participle that flows from this Pope's mouth? Now, I would suggest to you that the former is by far the more attractive missionary proposition. Okay? Uh, and so if I can leave you with one final thought, it would be, uh, I think it would be to the benefit of, of all of us, and particularly to the benefit of the missionary prospects of the church, if we can do everything we can to promote a unified response to the energies being created in the Francis papacy, rather than feeding them through the sausage grinder of the tribal divisions that so often afflict Catholic life in the United States. Let me be concrete. For those of you who are on the liberal end of the spectrum, can I invite you to one bit of Lenten discipline? Can you please refrain from the tendency to use Pope Francis as a club to beat up on other people in the church you do not like? That is, can you stop waving his picture in the face of bishops you don't like and screaming at them, why can't you be more like him? Okay, that is counterproductive and it's divisive. Now, those of you who find yourselves on the conservative end of the spectrum, can I invite you to your own form of Lenten discipline? which is, and I know everything in, your, in, the, in our culture tells you this is wrong, but can you please own the idea that you don't have to have an opinion about something five seconds after it happens? Okay, can you please sit with what this pope is saying, pray over it, meditate on it, reflect on it, digest it, uh, and, and exercise a degree of patience, resist the rush to judgment, because I think if you give this time to play out, I think you too will be surprised about where it ends, okay? If we can collectively do those things, if we can come together as a community to embrace the new possibilities that Francis is creating, rather than becoming even more badly divided by them, that, ladies and gentlemen, I would suggest to you, is a winning strategy for the new evangelization every day of the week and twice on Sunday. Thank you, God bless you. God bless Malloy College. Viva il Papa! Alan, for that wonderful talk. Um, you know, we really were quite fortunate tonight to have someone with his years of experience covering the Vatican to provide us with some context on the first year of uh, Pope Francis's papacy. What we're going to do now is we'll turn the show over to you, so to speak. We'll have microphones on either side. If anyone would like to take the opportunity to ask a question, just raise your hand, and we have two wonderful people who will bring the microphones to you. Uh, thank you for that wonderful discussion on the Pope. Um, well, I thank you for your excellent taste in oratory. Oh. 
Um, I thought one of the more interesting media events was when The Advocate came out and they made him Man of the Year, right. and they used five powerful words saying,